no PowerPoint. Um, I'll, I'll make five points. Uh, number one, Shakespeare's networks. Uh, I hope everybody has the handout. There's a network on both uh, sides of the page. Uh, number two, <coughs> theory of creativity <coughs> by recombination and negation. Point number three, how Shakespeare transformed not only his predecessor's plays, but his own earlier plays. Number four, how Shakespeare transformed blood and gore shockers into complex tragedies of self-destruction. And number five, how Shakespeare became a great poet. So, so let's start by trying to explicate uh, figure one, which is Shakespeare's network of actors in and uh, playwrights. Now, pretty much everything that's that's in this is you know well well known in the specialized literature. But I've never seen anybody draw draw a diagram of Shakespeare's actual network uh, uh, context. I mean, some of these things. Well, this one is it, I think is absolutely certain. The one on the on the other side is a little bit more conjectural, but I think could be strongly. Uh, uh, defended. What I want to bring out here is that um, it's not just a network of uh, playwrights, you know, which is a typical way of thinking of our people in a field networked uh, uh, t together. Um, but uh, r rather, it's a, a combination of playwrights and actors. And it's kind of worth bearing in mind that Shakespeare was an actor. He probably was an actor for at least five, six, seven years before he started becoming famous in 1592. Uh, and the actors who acted in his plays were either the same ones or had worked together with the people who worked, uh, who, who acted in the plays by uh, Thomas Kidd and Christopher Marlowe, uh, which uh, were the big successes of the stage between uh, 1587 uh, and around uh, 1590 or, or uh, 91. Uh, so the part of my argument that I'm making is um, the actors are really carrying the techniques of how you actually do plays. The, and uh, the Playwrights are quite definitely writing plays for actors. So in, in a certain sense, the important names here actually are uh, uh, Edward Allen and uh, William Burbage. Edward Allen played the flamboyant roles that made Elizabethan theater a sensation from 1587 on. Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy, which was the uh, big, most popular a play, a very blood and gore uh, a play. Uh, the body, the stage is not only lit littered with bodies, but the goriest part is where the, uh, the uh, protagonist bites out his own tongue on stage to keep himself from talking under torture while his daughter writes a letter in her own blood. <laughs> the play features a series of hagging, stabbing, suicides, and burnings at the stake. Several characters go mad on stage when they learn where it's happening. Toned down versions of this mad scenes are used by Shakespeare later with Ophelia and, and Lear. So in a certain sense, it's kind of all there in Kidd. And, and um, Shakespeare definitely knew uh, Kidd. And there's very strong evidence that uh, one of Shakespeare's earliest plays, quite possibly the earliest plays, Henry VI, part three, which is very kind of long drawn out. Uh, a play was co-written with Kidd and uh, other people. Uh, Kidd uh, not only knew Marlowe, they were roommates, uh, and they employed the same bunch of, of uh, uh, actors. Um, Allen, um, along with William Shakespeare's fellow actor on the great tragic part, Richard Burbage, um, were all theater entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, Burbage and Allen um, failed in negotiations to unite the two leading companies of that time, the Lord Admiral's Men and the Lord Chamberlain's Men. They formed rival companies, and Shakespeare became a principal shareholder of the latter. So it's um, the yeah, uh, 
th this is very, very much a theater in which the actors are running things. They are, they are shareholders. Uh, they're having parts written uh, uh, for them, uh, and uh, they, uh, for the most part, are, are uh, playwrights themselves. I think Marlowe is the exception there. He doesn't seem to be very important as a, as an a actor, but uh, more specialized as a as a playwright. I've got Ben Johnson in there at the end because he actually is in Shakespeare's co company. You, you see a kind of a next generation uh, uh, effect there. Uh, Shakespeare's uh, company didn't just do his own plays. They did other people's plays. They did some of Ben Johnson's plays and uh, uh, Shakespeare allegedly acted in one of Ben Johnson's uh, uh, plays. Um, the most famous comic actor, William Kemp, was both in Strange's Company and Shakespeare's and contributed to his string of successful co comedies and uh, vi vice versa. Um, as we see in the network, Shakespeare has a two-link connection to Marlowe through several intermediaries and he collaborated with Kidd in the early 50s, as I've just, as I've just uh, said. Um, Burbage played the, the title roles in the Spanish tragedy, which was re revived many times in the 1590s, as well as he played the title role in Richard III, Hamlet, Othello, and Lear. I mean, so like th this was a big star a a actor. Um, the, um, Shakespeare is writing roles particularly for uh, him. Um, uh, Allen, uh, Edward, Edward Allen, uh, as I, I said, not only played the a major role in uh, uh, Kids, Thomas Kidd's big hit, but also in the plays that made Marlowe famous between 1587 and 90. He played Tamerlane, he played Dr. Faustus, he played the Jew of Malta, uh, and the, um, the, the Shylock and the Merchants of, of, of Venice is pretty much a remake of, of that, although in a way that we can go, go into, it's a better made play and a more dramatic uh, ca character than uh, the uh, earlier Marlowe uh, version. Okay, so uh, enough, enough said about the, the network, except um, I want to say something about the number of links. Um, uh, first order links are obviously important. Second order links, I th think, are quite reliable way of communicating techniques and cultural capital to other people. Um, it's been said that you can, within six links, you can almost link anybody to everybody. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I think going very far beyond two links is probably not worthwhile. Um, there's another reason for that is that uh, sort of well-known ex experiments in social psychology are about what we would call rumor transmission. See, so if I whispered in the ear of Hugo and he whispered in the ear of Mike and he whispered in the ear of Gary, we can be pretty certain by the time we got to Gary, the message has shifted. You know, you kind of lose the nuances as you, as you go along. And so for that reason, I think, think you know, two, two uh, links is important. Um, but you can also see that on the other side when I talk about the, his relationships with other, other poets. He has a two-link relationship with Sir Philip Sidney, who is the most important and innovative poet of, of his time. You know, so uh, if, if we're concerned about uh, yeah, the, the big stars propagating other stars. There's clearly a, a uh, two-link uh, connection between Shakespeare and Marlowe. Vi vi and and uh, similarly uh, with Sidney, via several routes. Uh, so, uh, and even though there's, a little, there's kind of a lot of you know, fog around that period, but I think that's pretty undoable. That's um, what was going on. Okay, point one was, his networks. Um, point number two, a, a bit of theory. Creativity by recombination and uh, negation. Um, so I'm drawing on analysis that I use in the sociology of, of uh, philosophy, which is uh, analyzed uh, both philosophers and mathematicians. Uh, being creative means having the techniques that make to do something that becomes famous. Where do the techniques come from? They come from the network, one's immediate predecessors, collaborators, and rivals, in part because becoming creative on your own means to make new techniques. 
This is done by combining techniques from the past or reversing some into their opposite, thus creating new effects. Um, close acquaintance with the network of previous creators is important because you need to internalize the techniques until you can roll with them, generating a flow of emotional energy. This internal process is what outsiders can't see when it impresses them as overpowering genius. But when you get up close to it, Shakespeare is not a genius until maybe Richard III. You know, before that, he's just a journeyman. He hasn't got the techniques. And he, and, but an interesting thing about him is that once he gets going on this sort of method of recombining and negating certain things, then, and then uh, he keeps rolling on the same pathway. He keeps on not just transforming other people's plays, which he, he's constantly doing that, but he transforms his own plays into you know, the next ones along the line. A famous example in the history of mathematics is creating new geometries by negating one of the postulates in Euclid's classical geometry and examining the properties of the new geometries that resulted. Following this example, a number of different non-Euclidean geometries were created from the 1820s uh, onwards. Analogously, and probably at, you know, picking up on the, the tactic the geometricians had used, new algebras were created by formalizing the axiom of arithmetic and then negating or reversing one of them, going on to examine the properties of the algebras, the results, such as you, you negate the commutative law of algebra and you get a non-commutative uh, uh, algebra and the, the development of what was called higher mathematics uh, followed this path pathway. Uh, interestingly enough, it sort of pioneered in England, but the people who really did it were the, uh, the German ac academic uh, mathematicians. They recognized by the time you get to the 1870s, they were saying, we can create any kind of mathematics we want. It doesn't have to be uh, you know, bound to the you know, rules of the three dimensional uh, world. Um, Okay, so I'm going to say that this creativity by reversal and recombination uh, operates is the way Shakespeare operated. Now I'm going to jump a little bit forward to uh, his couple of his most famous plays. Two of Shakespeare's most famous plays, Hamlet and Macbeth, have this same plot. A king is killed, a murderer takes his place, the king's son seeks revenge, and finally kills the usurper. Um, Macbeth was written about five years after Hamlet for the new monarch from Scotland. For this command performance, Shakespeare takes his best previous play and he reverses several basic elements. Hamlet is presented from the point of view of the son. Macbeth is presented from the point of view of the murderer. The character Macbeth is like Claudius. If the scene where the king is praying for his sins is magnified into the entire play about guilt. The character of the avenging son shifts drastically from the moody Hamlet to the bland character of Malcolm, who gets defocused by shifting away from this side of the story. The other major plot device remains the same, bracketing the story with supernatural. They both start out, Hamlet with a ghost, the witches in Macbeth, in a revelation scene where their murderer freaks out guiltily in front of his court. The power of psychological drama that Shakespeare discovered in Hamlet, the complexity of his self-examination, are shifted over to Macbeth and his wife, who now get the famous soliloquies. To be or not to be becomes out damned spot. Ghosts have been used before. Kid's Spanish tragedy keeps up the ghost of the murdered man on stage throughout the play, but he does not communicate with anyone but the audience. Shakespeare uses ghosts namely Hamlet's father and, in, and the murdered Banquo, to bring out the protagonist's inner voices. Ghosts became a visible means to depict on stage the drama going on inside someone's mind. Whether Shakespeare consciously intended his ghost for this purpose is dubious. He was just working his for way forward, using, rearranging his materials. When he hit on something that generated more dramatic scenes, he used it again. I mean, so I'm arguing these, it's not these images. Shakespeare is the great psychologist. Yeah, Shakespeare is a real professional uh, actor and playwright. And so this is a very pragmatist kind of thing. If it works, let's do it again, or better yet, let's twist it and do it again. Um, Shakespeare didn't invent everything anew. He rearranges key elements to, to generate new effects. The pl basic plot of virtually every play Shakespeare wrote can be traced to some previous source 
the main elements of Hamlet, the murder, etc., had already existed, had been staged uh, as recently as 1594. The divisive play within a tra play is already there in the Spanish uh, tragedy. Um, Shakespeare takes the device in a new direction by shifting the dramatic emphasis on the timing. By having Hamlet delay and equivocate with himself, Shakespeare develops a new form of plot tension. This too is a reversal of the predominant style. The blood and thunder tragedies of nonstop treachery and, and uh, uh, carnage, which is you know, certainly what uh, ki uh, kids play was like, and on the whole it's, it's uh, what uh, Shakespeare's earliest uh, plays were like. Um, another innovation on the Hamlet story is to weave in a subplot. As we all know, a subplot provides comic relief and suspense by retarding the action. Compare his early plays like Henry VI or, or uh, Titus Andronicus to see what non-stop single file action felt like without it. I mean, there's tr tremendous amount of action in Titus Andronicus. It gets a little tiring because people are getting killed and having their hands chopped off, you know, all over the stage. And it's, you know, kind of like you, ne you never get a relief uh, uh, from it. Hamlet is as structurally satisfying as a Wagnerian musical com climax because the subplot eventually merges with the main, main plot. This is kind of what Wagner did with his light motifs. He's playing with them, playing with them, playing with them, and building it up until he, you, when you finally resolve the thing, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of like having a musical orgasm at the end of a, you know, when Wagner uh, uh, opera finally gets to its climax. Now, Hamlet, Pre it pretends magnet, madness. He gets proof of the guilt, but he fails to kill Claudius. Now what? The play is stuck, except that Polonius, who's been the main comic relief, gets himself killed. Since he's been, since he's been interfering with his daughter Ophelia's affair with Hamlet, the murder drives her to death, and her hothead brother Laertes uh, comes to challenge uh, ha Hamlet, and, and, and so forth. The the Polonius Ophelia Larity subplot is not in Shakespeare's sources. That's the one part of the play that he invented, the part that wasn't really a, about, about Hamlet, but it's the key structural uh, innovation. Um, where am I now? Okay. Um, Let's go back to about 1590. A no longer a young actor with five years or so of experience in London and probably provincial touring theaters joins with his colleagues in writing plays. Uh, Histories of the Kings of England have recently been public, published. They reverberate well on the stage as Marlowe proved in Tamerlane, um, which is 1587 approximately. Shakespeare goes to the same material and the same techniques. His first venture is sort of a joint production like a typical Hollywood rewriting confabulation. Henry VI is a blow-by-blow blow account of the War of the Roses. It's so long it takes up three separate plays. There's a lot of material, conspiracies, rebellions, battles, trumpet flourishes, grand speech speeches. The trouble is there's so much of it, the plot tension lags, there's so many characters that none stand out. It's got Joan of Arc in it, and it has all the you know, sort of famous scenes, except Joan of Arc is just straightforward, you know, you know, villain. Uh, she's not given any psychological complexity at, at all. It's just like you know, straightforward English uh, 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 propaganda. Uh, George Bernard Shaw really took Shakespeare to, to task for that. He said, you, know, can you, ru you ruin good material uh, here, here with that. The, the, the Henry VI miniseries only comes alive in the very last act of part three. We've just gone through the climatic battle of the War of Roses, and one of the numerous characters, he's not particularly important because there's so many characters in this play, Richard of Gloucester, he steps to the front of the play, the stage, and he delivers the first truly dramatic soliloquy in these plays. I mean, totally check this, this out, but solilo soliloquy is in the sense of speaking your mind to, to the audience as compared to something that's quite typically done as saying, okay, um, the action is over and now we're going to Nottingham, you know, so that the people will know they didn't have a curtain. Okay, so in a certain sense, that's a soliloquy, but it's not a psychological uh, soliloquy. Uh, this is one of Shakespeare's most famous uh, in innovations. Um, 
Richard of Gloucester tells the audience his intention not to let the, his older brothers reign, but eliminate one by one until he's on his throne. Now, you might tab Richard as the stock character of the plotting villain, but the next play, Richard III, has a radically different structure. Virtually the same soliloquy starts, now is the summer of our discontent made glorious. No, that was the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by the son of York. You know, that he's going on, but I have misshapen and not fit for these amorous plays, etc. You know, so you kind of, you've got, you've got this complicated villain right in the middle of the stage. I mean, it's, it's great for Richard Burbage to play. So he's kind of got to tone it down from, you know, what he, what he was doing with, uh, you know, Marlowe and, and uh, Kidd. Has Shakespeare discovered uh, you know, uh, psychology? You know, so I know Harold Bloom sort of argues that, yes, yeah, like, so he's created the modern man and so forth. I, th I think that he's not seeing Shakespeare as a professional playwright. More likely, Shakespeare figured out that simplifying the plot and focusing on the villain's point of view is more dramatically effective than nonstop violence and loud declamatory speeches. With this structure, psychological complexity had to grow. In the, okay, um, Richard III is the biggest single step in Shakespeare's playwriting career. He has a model he will vary and recombine into his greatest tragedies. He has learned how to make complex villain-centered drama. The result is a series of dramas where the prime mover of action and the most important character is the villain. The Merchant of Venice, which is about 1595, so that's very soon after Richard III, is a remake of Marlowe's The Jew of Malta, but Shylock is a much more memorable figure than Marlowe's Barabbas, although it's uh, played by the same actor. He's more villainous. Instead of political treachery of selling out a city, which is, which is in Marlowe, he makes this infamous pound of flesh contract for a loan, but he also <laughs> gets to plead eloquently for his human humanity. Hath not a Jew eyes? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? There's nothing like that, that in, um, in Marlowe. Marlowe's Barabbas is you know, just a you know, evil sta stage victim. Um, like an experiment. Um, uh, Shakespeare's uh, re revamping of the Jew of Malta proves that um, villains can be the center of emotional energy, dominating both the other characters and the audience. And as, as I said, the famous actors, Edward Allen and Richard Burbage, played all, the, all these juicy uh, parts from you know, Barabbas on through to Sky Shylock. And then, interestingly enough, if we're going to play the more moody you know, character like, like Hamlet and, and so forth. Um, okay. Um, all right, so where are we now? Six. The most complex figures are the tragic protagonists who are their own worst enemy. And so this kind of working, you know, be beyond um, uh, you know, R Richard, who can, you're kind of getting inside the mind of a, of a villain, but he's, uh, he's a pretty impressive ca character, but, but not a sympathetic one. Um, Hamlet and Lear tend to be regarded by intellectuals as Shakespeare's most serious plays. Um, generations of critics have analyzed these characters as if they were real people whose psychological complexities they're exposed to us to understand. Is it paradoxical that no one among the critics agrees what drives Hamlet or Iago or Lear? Here is a sociological interpretation based on the process of creativity. They are not real people. <laughs> they are not people who Shakespeare observed or intuited. They have nothing to do with Shakespeare's own personality. They, they are characters developed in the process of writing a series of plays. Why can't Hamlet kill the king? Because if he kills him in Act Three, the play is over. <laughs> the main plot for plot device for fighting reasons to delay. The, the, the main plot device is finding reasons for delay, and Hamlet's character is generated in the process of writing the play. I mean, so the mad, the, you know, the strategy of pretending you're mad is in the earlier sources, um, but. What's different is that he's now he's stringing it out. He can't, 
He can't make up his mind. The, the device of the dramatic self-regarding soliloquy that Shakespeare pioneered Richard III enables him to have Hamlet speak wonderfully poetic speeches to himself. See, as Harold Bloom says, like, this is the beginning of modern subjectivity. Well, that's uh, giving a lot of influence to the theater, the, you know, the theater being able to uh, create this. And I think Harold Bloom kind of thinks as if Hamlet's a real person, you know, rather than seeing that he, he's you know, you know, part of the, of the drama. Um, I'm, I'm going uh, back, back, back just a, li a little, little bit uh, here. The big successes of the theater market, what you can call the blood and gore market, were when Shakespeare is an apprentice actor with Kidd and, and Marlowe. It's not at all impossible and probably very likely that uh, Shakespeare may have played in some of Marlowe's and Kidd's plays. I mean, given the way in which uh, you know, his own particular company didn't get organ organized until 1594 when he himself is all now recognized as a, a, a leading playwright. And so he gets to be one of the shareholders in that, that uh, a company. Uh, Marlowe wrote flamboyant scenes, especially famous for Tamerlane cracking the whip over conquered kings, or Faustus inviting the devil into his study. But his plots are often jumbles, lacking plot tension and petering out in the later acts. Marlowe was a better dramatic poet uh, than he was a playwright, and it's at this point where uh, you know, Shakespeare uh, uh, comes in. Uh, and, and I've sort of t um, mixed up the, you know, the chronological uh, or order uh, he here. He uh, 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 keeps transforming his various plays into uh, uh, more complex versions of the early one, as I illustrated in the case of you tr transform Hamlet in into, um, uh, into Macbeth. Uh, and you can do you know, somewhat uh, similar uh, analyses of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, play, plays like um, uh, King Lear. Uh, but I'm going to skip over uh, now because Shakespeare is not only, you know, the great dramatic uh, poet, but, I mean, the, yeah, the great dramatic playwright, but he's also a great poet. Okay, so here's where we have to go back to the other uh, uh, diagram. Um, Shakespeare's creativity as a poet was a big part of his success as a playwright since his network wrote plays in verse. Shakespeare not only wrote the best plays, but the best poetry. And the power of his dramatic scenes, especially the great soliloquies, hinges on their poetry. If he's already a leading dramatist by the time of Richard III, which is kind of the early to mid 1590s, soon after in Romeo and Juliet, which is 1596, he has his poetic technique fully worked out. He could go it alone as a poet, as he did during 1593 to 94 when the theaters were closed because of the plague and when he wrote his sonnets in Venus and Adonis. The two kinds of techniques may have come at the same time, but they're not the same. He kept on innovating as a playwright while his poetic style has already hit his high plateau. His skill as a poet came fairly, fairly early. How did he get it? An actor in the first years of his career, he must have memorized a great deal of verse. He could probably think in verse, talk to himself in, in verse. After a while, he'd get to the point of being able to say anything as temporaneously in the verse rhythms used in plays. He acquired great facility in the poetic style of his contemporaries in a similar way as the 20th century songwriter Irving Berlin, who was a street performer and singing waiter from age 13 to 23. He knew all the popular songs by repetition before writing his first hit song. Um, the, well, I, I'll, I'll skip most, most of the rest, rest about that, that but uh, uh, Irving Berlin, at the age of 23, has already been in this bit business of uh, you know, hawking newspapers on the street and uh, you know, singing out the, the latest hits. Uh, he, he's got you know, maybe you know, 12, 14, 14 years of practice you know, before he uh, uh, ventures into doing it himself. And it, it's, uh, it, it that's, it's, um, seems to be the, the way in which uh, it worked for Shakespeare. For both Shakespeare and Berlin, their early careers involved the most intimate process of internalizing what the rest of the field did by performing it constantly. 
Um, I uh, footnote here a recent uh, paper by uh, Ju Young Lee, it's an ethnography of rappers in improvising on street karma competitions in Los Angeles. He says, aspiring rap artists often practice in their day daily lives by trying to say everything in rhyme. Shakespeare's life is undocumented from 1585 when he was 21 and still in Stratford-on-Avon until 1592 when his success in the London theater was noted. He did not necessarily start his acting career in London. There were wandering troops of players performing at country houses. Uh, the, and there's a little more you know, d detail here. Uh, one of his early plays, The Taming of the Shrew, uh, is a play within the play and the setting is a country house near Warwick, uh, a few miles from uh, Stratford where he grew up. And of course, the traveling players in ha Hamlet you know, pr pretty much uh, depict you know, what the uh, 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 acting world was, was uh, like, at least in his er early period. Um, since players focused on country houses, joining a band of players, perhaps temporarily at first, would have been simultaneously a way of learning the artist craft and to meet aristocratic patrons. His poetry resembles his predecessor, Sir Philip Sidney, who around 1580 turned traditional slow-moving six-beat verse into iambic pentameter. He also popularized the sonnet and opened the way for the ringing five-beat line of Marlowe's plays. And I'm trying to you know, say this as un untechnically as, as possible. That's what's called Alexandrine is da 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 It's slow. And the, uh, you know, shall I compare you to a summer's day? You know, it's kind of like the, the five beat uh, uh, poem just uh, you know, moves, moves faster and kind of has, if you're doing rhymes, it's a better rhyme, rhyming uh, sc scheme. He knows the new poetry intimately, both through his network contacts and by memorizing and performing this kind of work. Remember, the guy was an actor for, he was an actor for five or six years before he wrote plays, and then he continues to act in his own plays for you know, at least another t 10, maybe uh, 15 years. Um, his greatest poetry is in his plays because the new kind of characters and situations he developed gave his poetic technique more subtle and dramatic materials to put into spoken lines. Shakespeare's aristocratic patrons formed his poetry. His Stratford neighbor, Fulk Greville, himself a well-known poet, was a friend of Sir Philip Sidney, the innovator who popularized the sonic, sonnet sequence. Sidney died young and his poems circulated by hand. At the center of the circle was his former mistress, the beautiful sister of the Earl of Essex, a patroness of literary men. You see, you'll see this on the, uh, the, this, the network number two. The, uh, the, the po poets and aristocratic patrons are uh, very much connected together. Another of Essex's friend was Shakespeare's patron, the Earl of Southampton, the object of Shakespeare's own sonnet sequence. Shakespeare's sonnets are patterned on Sidney's and circulated in the elite literary network, even more effectively than by publication, which did not occur until 1609. In the network, Shakespeare is two lengths away from Sydney via two different connections. He would have heard a good great deal about him and probably saw his not yet printed poems. Um, summing up, Shakespeare's role models died as he was acquiring his own techniques. Sydney died in 1586, Marlowe in 1593, Kidd in 1594, leaving a vacuum to step into. The network passing along its techniques to those best energized to develop them is truly the actor on the literary stage. We could summarize Shakespeare's creativity in the formula, how Shakespeare's network internalized in Shakespeare created Shakespeare. Thank you very much. <laughs>